Then we're in now. You were one of what? Me one. Islamic Secondary School for Boys in Maryland, uh, just on Maryland Road, and currently I'm studying economics at King's College London. <coughs> so I'll be reciting some verses from the Quran in regards to fasting, and also inshallah I will be um, reading the translation of those verses as well. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم يا أيها الذين آمنوا كتب عليكم الصيام كتب عليكم الصيام كما كتب على الذين من قبلكم لعلكم تتقون أياما ما 
معدودات فمن كان منكم مريضا أو على سفر فعدة من أيام أخر وعلى الذين يطيقونه فدية طعام مسكين فمن تطوع خيرا فهو خير له وأن تصوموا خير لكم إن كنتم تعلمون شهر رمضان الذي أنزل فيه القرآن هدى للناس وبينات من الهدى والفرقان فمن شهد منكم الشهر فليصم ومن كان مريضا أو على سفر فعدة من أيام أخر يريد الله بكم اليسر ولا يريد بكم العسر ولتكملوا العدة ولتكبروا الله على ما هداكم ولعلكم تشكرون وإذا سألك عبادي عني فإني قريب أجيب دعوة الداعي إذا دعان فليستجيبوا لي وليؤمنوا بي لعلهم يرشدون أحل لكم ليلة الصيام الرفث إلى نسائكم هن لباس لكم وأنتم لباس لهم علم الله أنكم كنتم ثم تختالون أنفسكم فتاب عليكم فتاب عليكم وعفى عنكم فالآن باشرون وابتغوا ما كتب الله لكم وكلوا واشربوا حتى يتبين لكم الخيط الأبيض من الخيط الأسود من الفجر ثم أتموا الصيام إلى الليل ولا تباشروهن وأنتم عاكفون في المساجد تلك حدود الله تلك حدود الله فلا تقربوها كذلك يبين الله آياته للناس لعلهم يتقون ولا تأكلوا أموالكم بينكم بالباطل وتدلوا بها إلى الحكام وتدلوا بها إلى الحكام لتأكلوا فريقا من أموال الناس بالإثم وأنتم تعلمون صدق الله العظيم A'udhu billahi min ash-shaytan ar-rajim I seek refuge in the accursed shaytan in the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the most merciful, the most compassionate Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala begins by saying You who believe fasting is prescribed for you as it was prescribed for those before you so that you may be mindful of God Fast for a specific number of days but if any one of you is ill or on a journey, on other days later. For those who can fast only with extreme difficulty, there is a way to compensate, feed a needy person. But if anyone does good of his own accord, it is better for him. And fasting is better for you if only you knew. 
It was the month. It was in the month of Ramadan that the Quran was revealed as guidance for mankind, clear messages giving guidance and distinguishing between right and wrong. So any one of you who is present that month should fast, and anyone who is ill or on a journey should make up for the lost days by fasting on other days later. God wants ease for you, not hardship. He wants you to complete the prescribed period and to glorify Him for having guided you so that you may be thankful. Prophet, if my servants ask you about me, I am near. I respond to those who call me. So let them respond to me and believe in me so that they may be guided. You, believers, are permitted to lie with your wives during the night of the fast. They are close as garments to you, as you are to them. God was aware that you were betraying yourselves, so He turned to you in mercy and pardoned you. Now you can lie with them, seek what God has ordained for you, eat and drink until the white thread of dawn becomes distinct from the black. Then fast until nightfall. Do not lie with them during the nights of your devotion and retreat in the mosques. These are the bounds set by God, so do not go near them. In this way, God makes His messages clear to people, that they may guard themselves against wrong. Do not consume your property wrongfully, nor use it to bribe judges, intending sinfully and knowingly to consume parts of other people's property. Thank you very much. Give me the other one. It's really about all this swapping the mics about and whatnot. <laughs> So, Jazakumullah khair, and thank you very much to Imam Abdul Karim for that beautiful recitation. I'm sure we can all agree it was a profound reminder of the power of faith and the beauty of diversity in our community. I'd like to talk now a little bit about Kamal Masjid itself and the activities we provide for our community. We run many faith-based activities, but we also run activities that are open to our wider community. From Monday to Friday, on Monday mornings, we have tea talk, which I'm sure a lot of you are aware of. It's a really lovely time in the morning where you can come in. We have tea, coffee, and other items available just to come and have a chat with the members of staff and whoever's available during the time. On Monday to Friday, we run the Hifth class, which is known as Quran memorization classes, and we run those in the evening for the boys. And on Tuesday to Thursday, we run Maktab classes, which is known as learning about the Quran and Islam. And this is for all children from the age of 5 all the way to 16. On Thursdays and Fridays, we run Hadith and Tafsir classes. So Hadith is the sayings of the Prophet Muhammad wasallam, and we discuss these and we reflect on them on the Thursday classes. And on Fridays, we learn more about the teachings of the Quran and we run these after the daily prayers. On Friday, we also run a food bank for our wider community and we have 177 people registered on our food bank list. We spend £40,000 yearly to donate towards these food bank uh, packages. And the 40k is made up entirely through donation of our Muslim community. And it is open to all. So we have many, many people. As I mentioned, we have 177 people registered and we're taking more. On Saturdays, which I would say are the busiest day of the week for Kanpur Masjid, we start the morning with a mother-toddler session. So this is free and it's open to all. We run from 11.30 to 12, no, sorry, 11 o'clock to 12.30. We run those for mothers and toddlers. We have free coffee, tea for the mothers to come sit, have a chat, and there's lots of toys for the children to play with. And then we run a girls' and boys' youth club. So for the boys' youth club, they do things like they go to the park, they play PlayStation, football. And for the girls, we do a lot more art-based activities, crafting, beading, whatever it is they want. So the girls give us their opinions on what they want to do for the next week, and we try and do that for them. We also run tuition on Saturdays. So that's from 11 a.m. to 3 p.m. And we run it for SATs and GCSEs. Again, this is open to all. We have many children registered. 
And we also have um, Jiu Jitsu for boys on Sunday and Tai Chi for girls on, on Sunday as well. Um, we also run work workshops, so you've probably seen a few of these on our signboards. Um, we run these, we try to run these monthly, but it ends up being once every two months. So far we've run a live animals workshop, we've run a circus skills workshop, a baking workshop, we've also run mad science skills, slime making, and just last month we had an exam preparation seminar for all those students that are heading into their exam season. So if you do want to enrol for any of these activities, you can contact myself or we've got our chairman over here, Saeed Shafi, or you can email on asha at canhall.org. You can follow our social media at Canhall Masjid to stay updated. And now I would like to introduce Imam Mujahid. He is our head Imam and he leads the daily prayers at Canhall Masjid. He also conducts the sermons and he conducts the marriage ceremonies and he also offers marriage counselling for our community. The Imams play a very central role in the masjid, as you can see, with all of his responsibilities. Tonight, Imam Mujahid will shed light on the profound connection between Ramadan and the Qur'an, and he'll tell us more about how we can deepen our faith and spirituality, and there will be a Q&A at the end. Good evening, everybody. So I think you get to hear from me once a year, and because there's so many familiar faces. And what I really feel is that I'm going to if I talk, I'll be lecturing, you know. And I'm not. And we didn't invite you for a long lecture here. We invited you for for a meal here. So I'm going to make it very short. Ramadan, uh, Ramadan, Quran, Ramadan, Quran. I'm, I'm hearing this just now, so okay. Ramadan is the Quran, and the verse is that our young Imam just read to all of you is actually like a, a demo, you could say, of what is in the Quran. And what's in the Quran? So a, lot of, a lot of us, we used to ask this question, what is inside the Quran? We're very lucky now because we have a lot of transition. We never had transition before. Uh, the Quran is in Arabic language. So let me just say a couple of things about it. Quran is in Arabic language, and the transition is, the best way to explain is like a shadow. You know, if you look at the shadow, you can't say that's the original person, that's the shadow. So Quran is, a, is the nearest meaning, in English translation, the nearest meaning to Arabic. That's why Muslims are required to learn Arabic first. So everybody, you know, if you, anyone who embraces Islam, they have to learn Arabic language. And the least that we could do is teach them how to read the Quran. And that's what Aisha was mentioning, the children, they come here, and they learn how to recite the Quran. And it's really fun because they're not native, so they have to learn, you know, it's like learning a new language. I myself, for example, I have to learn the language as well. Uh, the whole, you know, I learned the language for like 10 years. So it like, then I just became very passionate about the language more than the Quran itself. I went to poetry and classical poetry and poetry that was sung like um, before the birth of Prophet Muhammad. So I'm talking about the Bedouins, you know, they really described the, the you know, especially when it was in mountains and rain. I've never seen someone so passionate talking about rain that a Bedouin living in the desert. Because to us British people, it rains every day, so we don't, we, don't, you know, we don't appreciate rain. But he talks about what rain does, it brings out life. And so I went to so much more deeper into poetry in, in Arabic, and that's what I teach now, I teach poetry as well in Arabic language. So when the Imam was reciting the verses, if you notice that he spoke about God is giving command. So that's what, that's what the Quran is, the Quran is always commanding us, telling us you have to do this, you have to do that, you have to abstain from this, you have to abstain from that. So this is one of the things we have in the Quran. The Quran talks about how you get, how can you draw proximity to God Almighty? How can you get near to God? So he says that, look, raise your hand, pray to me. I'm all hearing, I'm all seeing, I'm all knowing, I'm omnipotent, I'm omnipresent. I know what you're doing. So it gives you a sort of realization that God is with me. I'm not alone. But at the same time, also the Imam recited that God also doesn't forget our livelihood. He doesn't forget us and our family time. So he gives us advice that you know, those of you who are, are married, that make sure that you have your relationship with your wife, when to have it and when not to, etc. So Quran is full of guidance and advice on what to do. And that is the reason why us Muslims, it's very important for us to learn the Quran, to understand the Quran, and try our very best to live a life according to the Quran. What happens in the month of Ramadan is, uh, as we call it the month of the Quran, is two reasons. One, 
he recited in front of you. Month of Ramadan is the month when the Quran was revealed to Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, and all of the prophets. And we Muslims get to hear the whole Quran from the beginning till the end in the month of Ramadan. And that happens in the night prayer. What's really interesting, the night prayer is not mandatory. It's actually a choice. The prayer that I just led now, uh, starts at 6 p.m., that's a mandatory prayer. Everyone has to attend. But you've seen we only had about rows up to here. But the night prayer, which is not obligatory, is a choice. We have no space anywhere in this, in, in this hall or anywhere in the back room. Anywhere. So it's pretty interesting, like, you know, uh, a lot of people, although they could pray at home, is advisable as well, but everybody likes to come to the mosque. And one of the reasons is because it's a beautiful environment here. The brothers are here, the sisters are here, the children are here. Our mosque is open for everybody. We also have toddlers' room as well. Mothers who have children, babies, and, you know, they're sleeping. They could put them to bed here as well, you know, and they could also join their prayers. And when they are tired, they go home. All this is happening here as well. And the reciters that we had, he was one of the reciters. We have two more. They are very good reciters, and they recite very slow, so it gives you the time to reflect and to ruminate. So this is the reason why, this is, this is what Ramadan is in Russia. We fast throughout the whole day, and in the night we get to listen to the Quran. And yes, we have meals, a nice meal. You'll see what we eat at the time of iftar. We'll get, a, we'll get an idea what we eat. So I don't know the menu, but I'm sure there will be biryani. The Shafi, he loves biryani, and whatever he loves, he wants to give it to you. And that's what he does, yeah? Shafi is that man over there smiling. Anyway, and um, talking about revelation very quickly as well, there's another speaker supposed to be here. Unfortunately, uh, he sent his apologies. He couldn't make it last minute. His wife is actually not well. So I pray that, you know, his wife uh, is giving cure back from Almighty God and me. And he's, he wants to talk about revelation, so I'll, I'll just touch on that. Revelation to us meaning when God revealed his message to his prophets. So for example, to us the land of revelation is Mecca. And that is the reason why we once, it's required from us to go to Mecca once, if we can afford. That's how the Quran says. And that's what people go for the pilgrimage. Right now, in the month of Ramadan, I've been told there was three to four million people have gathered already in Mecca. This is amazing. Because people like to spend the time in the land of revelation. Then Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, then he moved to my little Medina, which is another city next to Mecca. When I say next, it's about three to four hundred kilometers away from Mecca. So he migrated there, and lots of revelation towards the end of his life came, down, came over there as well. So that's why the Quran, if you open, it said, this was revealed in Mecca, this was revealed in Medina. So we have chapters revealed in Mecca and chapters in Medina. Most of the Meccan chapters are all about praise of God, about his power, reminding of the hereafter, and most of the surahs in Medina, chapters in Medina were revealed, talks about the commandments, what to do and what not to do and stuff like that. We also believe that before Prophet Muhammad, the revelation came to Abraham. Abraham was in Babylon, now it's called Iraq and the surrounding of Iraq. That's where he received revelation. And then he migrated to Palestine. And he lived in an area called al Khalil. now it's called Hebron. He lived there and he received revelation there as well. We also believe that revelation came to Moses, peace be upon him as well. Or we also believe that revelation came to Jesus, peace be upon him as well, in the surrounding areas of Jerusalem and, and, and other cities. So these are the land of revelation to us. Mecca is the land of revelation, Medina is the land of revelation, uh, Egypt and the surrounding is the land of revelation, because Moses, peace be upon him, was there. Medina is the land of revelation, because Moses, he migrated there, and then he had to go back again with his family to Pharaoh. And we also believe that the whole of Jerusalem and the surrounding is also the land of revelation because many, many prophets, they lived there, they preached there, and they were born there as well, and they also passed away there as well. So to us, revelation and the Quran is very important. One thing our Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, said is that he advised us three things. He said that, so the three mosques that he advised us to visit continuously. He said, if you can visit Mecca, visit Medina, and visit Al-Aqsa Mosque in Jerusalem. And that is why what's happening in the Middle East is very dearest to all Muslims and to everyone actually concerned. And that's why you probably are noticing that there's a lot of demonstration that happens every single time because we want peace and tranquility there the way it was before. And, and we all here, we, should, we will pray as well and hopeful, are very hopeful that, that there will be a ceasefire so that everybody could get on with their normal lives. But to us it's more important that area because of the reason I mentioned to you, because it are the land of revelation, these are the places of worship, we should be worshiping God there, 
and not fighting one another. So this is the prayer that we pray every night, actually in Ramadan, for peace and tranquility in those regions. Thank you very much. And if you have any questions, I'll take your questions now. Also, any of the foundation my colleague uh, Abdul Karim did, and if there's something, clarification you need, I'll give you that as well. So the floor is open for you now. Anyway. Let's stick to the topic first. Yeah. Anybody have any questions? The first one. Yes, go ahead, please. Are we giving the mic? Or no, I can talk. Oh, yeah, yeah, very loud. <laughs> um, with all the bloodshed in Gaza, I'm surprised that this, the surrounding Muslim countries haven't got together and stopped it. You just said prayer. Prayer's not working. They need a bit of action. Yeah, prayers to us is always working. Uh, so let me just connect you there because God has His own time. God is that Prophet Moses, he prayed for a very long time. People who were living in, in Egypt, they prayed for a very long time until Moses was sent to them. So this is, this is, to us, prayers are always working. Our definition of working is different than God's definition. But we have to continue to pray, and we have to have hope. And there will be an end of, of, of the war that's happening. But you've made a very good point. Muslim world are not doing enough. That's a very good point you made. It is, to, behind the scenes, to be honest with you, they are doing a lot. Because... We can go into a political discussion on this one. Why has it never happened? This is a question that I get asked here. Same question that you ask me. My congregation, they also ask me as well. So the political tension is, is basically we are on the verge of having probably another world war. This is how it is. Every single night, sir, in, I don't know if you know, in the border of Egypt and in the border of Jordan, there are people that are actually congregating. They want to go in and do something. This is how bad it is. The tension is very high. Just last night, half a million people was at the border of Jordan, in or the King Hussein Bridge, they call it. Between King Hussein Bridge, if you just cross that bridge, they call it, yeah, they call it King Hussein Bridge, we call it, the British, we call it the, what's the bridge again? Anybody knows? Name of the, the, the first commander who built that bridge, anybody knows? Just, just, just testing everybody's knowledge here. <laughs> we don't know? The Allenview Bridge. Okay, we should I get the Allen Bridge because you were, there you go. I thought you guys would know this, okay, anyway. <laughs> so they're going to the King Hussein Bridge. They are literally there. The problem was to go in, but they need to calm down. You can't just go in and get shot in the head. Simple as that. That's what they're saying. So people are, there's a lot of diplomatic conversation going on. A lot and lot has already has happened. But yeah, it is a very, very difficult answer. I don't know what's happening. But what can they do? Like, people should go there and fight. Fighting is not the way, it's going to make things more worse. So it's just a threat. Would yeah. Threat? yeah. And they all got together. Turkey's got a bigger military than we have. Yeah. So, so that's, that's what I was saying. That the, I think, realistically speaking, the moment someone makes a threat, we are going for another world war. It is actually. There's, people are living in fear. It would bring them to their senses. Yeah. No, you wouldn't. No, you wouldn't. So, I mean, that's your opinion, but the truth is, I think. Politicians are under pressure, but the truth is, it's actually reaching a very high level, and we are scared to be you. As Muslims, we are praying that it doesn't lead to that. The moment one country threatens that I will take action, there will be another country saying that we'll retaliate. Another one, and this is how things will become very worse. Politicians could ruin our lives to be honest with you. And the children, more, there will be more death of children, more death of women, more death of people like that. But the concern that you have, sir, we want more people to have this kind of voice, actually. I'll tell you why, because it will give everybody uh, an understanding that we are not happy with this. And a majority of the people, I went to a demonstration, uh, you know, in the early days, and I looked around, I didn't see Muslims. Lots of lots of non-Muslims. I realized that people realized it's not a religious war. It's actually a humanitarian crisis. We want this to stop. And that's a nice thing. I had so many Jewish rabbis telling me that people think we Jews are actually supporting, we are not. Make it clear to everybody. You are an imam, you have a duty. Tell them this. A Jewish rabbi from, from Hackney, they told me this. From Stoke Newington. They said, make sure you tell your congregation. Do you know what? It makes me very happy. And I actually know this from before. I traveled to Palestine 11 to 12 times already. So I know that I, 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 I integrate, I meet people, and I know. Not everybody within Israel is happy with what's happening as well. This is what, this is what I want to tell people. And I tell my congregation this, like that. But yeah, it is. It is it is the most difficult time I, as an imam, facing. I've never faced anything like that before. What's happening? And that's the reason why we pray, and we hope that hopefully there will be a ceasefire. I mean, just a week ago, there was an unanimous decision by UN for a ceasefire. That didn't get to stop. So I don't know what else will get 
just to start. But it will stop. Of America are now in favor of it is. And, and, and the race actually is, is raising very higher now. And there's a lot of pressure on America to take action as well as Britain as well. We could just praise it. And, I, and as a Muslim, I'm going to tell you that I believe in the prayers. And it will happen today or tomorrow. That's the hope that I have. Just, just from my observations, uh, it's really sad to see that the local MP is not here. Um, John Cries, is he the John Cries? Yeah, he's the local MP. Uh, has he sent an apology for his non-attendance or anything like that? Shafi will not, but we have invited him personally to come to the studio. We have contacted him as well. <coughs> so, Shafi, is he coming today? No, he's not coming. I didn't get any reply. Do you give a reason why? Do you give a reason why he's not here? No, he didn't reply then. No, is he tried to attempt it here, or was it just one off? But I gotta tell you, uh, he's, he has spoken here before. He has gave lectures, and we always welcome him to our mosque. On a Friday congregation, we gave him the I was leading the sermon. I stepped back to give him his five minutes. This is how we welcome and honor our local MP. So, is I there do. a possibility that the local councillors probably have the answer why he's not turned up? <laughs> Okay. I think, can I just request everybody, I don't want to make this into like a political no, discussion, no, 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 I'm saying, I want everybody to feel welcome here, and I want, yeah, but, but you're right, you know, but we will, we will try to get everybody, thank you. But please, I don't want to go into political discussion, because that's, because everybody has views, I have views, you have views, I don't want to clash with these views, you're in a mosque, and we're going to have a nice meal after this, and over the year we'll have this discussion, or political discussion, some people like that. But that's okay. <laughs> I'll leave it to that. Okay, anybody else? Yes, please go ahead. Thank you. I, I just love the fact that this has been expressed because yeah. everybody's moved by what's going on yeah. in the Palestine. Yeah. Of course we are. Of course. You know, children dying, you know, needlessly, and starving, and, you know, starving. And, and somehow, I mean, it is crucial to all of our beliefs and, you know, you know of, of how to be, be in the world, you know? Yeah. And I get we could expect more of the United Nations because ultimately this is about humanity itself. Absolutely. How we behave with, 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 one, with one another. And it's an enormous disrespect of all of how we feel, you know, about life and the love of life. And you know, I'm sure it hurts everybody yeah. here in the room. And that's, that's all I'm saying is like, yeah. for, the, for the love of God, for the love of Allah, let's Let's see if we cannot persuade our politicians to, to, to uh, invite the United Nations to be more yeah. forthcoming in doing something. Because yeah. we have, in, pre in previous conflicts, we have gone into countries in, as United Nations. And why we're not doing it right now has something to do with the politics of Israel, I suspect. And we have to get over that. You know, it's like we all have to, uh, you know, deal with that, that concern, but, you know, like, Absolutely. you know, and, and yeah. anyway, I, no, no, I, 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 I didn't want to make uh, no, I understand. I mean, what you have said is, what, feel it. absolutely, what you have said is the feeling of a lot of people here, we have actually written a lot of letters to various MPs asking them to take, uh, you know, actions, and we've done whatever we can, and I always preach my congregation here that legally what we can do, we should do. We can't let emotion take the better of us and just, you know, do things that we'll regret later on. Because even in our anger, we have to demonstrate justice and equality. This is very important. So we have written, with, I tell everybody, go on demonstration. I tell everybody, go on demonstration. A lot of my congregation, men, women, children, they all go on demonstration. And whatever we can, and I use the word legally very important because I don't want people to think like, you know what, I gotta do something wrong. You have to stay within the law, within the law of the country that you live in, and you know, you never know. Maybe someone will do something and will raise this. And hopefully, I thought it's taken very long. I've never expected it to be that long. I really, truly believe in myself that before the beginning of Ramadan, I thought it would, there would be a ceasefire. I really believe that so something was happening. Uh, even the American played a very important role to get a ceasefire just before Ramadan. Uh, President Biden specifically said that I'm going to be definitely push for six weeks of ceasefire. And he preached that openly. And for some reason it didn't happen. And I don't know the political details, and we know, and I don't want to go into it. It's not to do with hostility and religious little hostility from both sides, all of that. There's a lot going on, but there's a diplomatic pressure from all over the world on the, uh, 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 for, for a ceasefire. Hopefully it will happen, because you're right. 
every single day when we hear the news, it just becomes ridiculous, like another 200 died, another 300 died, another 200 died, and just numbers are increasing. And you get, you get to hear, you know, children and women, and obviously this is becoming, it's not common, we're talking about civilians here. And there's always numbers are rising, and it really, really hurts us. So I just, I think you know, I have to express it. As Muslims, this is this is very important, you know, this, this land. So we want a, a ceasefire as soon as possible. That's what we pray for, and, and we are actually writing. We are writing to the MPs, calling them, and asking them. You know, our message is going to be the Prime Minister as well, from all Muslim of UK. So everybody knows our positions. So let's just continue and hope for the best. Yes, right. But I also get we can all do something. We can all communicate to you know political leaders. We can all do that. Thank you. Let's all, that, all we can contribute. Thank we you. can do something that you know that yeah. you know, gives a bit of love to the you know the people who are experiencing all the wars. Oh, well, thank you very much. I'm sure everybody heard you now. I'll come to you. Can I? He raised his hand first. I'll come to you next. Yes, please. Uh, so you spoke about uh, revelation. Yes. Um, so can you give me just a maybe? How that happened, what that has looked like, and then a counter question is: I know that scripture is not going to be revealed today, but is a revelation that happens today for people who are praying? Okay, that's the second question. First question is: How yeah. did it happen? What does it look like? Thank you. So the revelation that I was speaking about is revelation is God communication with the prophet. So it doesn't happen to anybody else. It's only His chosen prophet. So God revelation came to Prophet Muhammad with the, with the, with the mediation of with the mediation of Gabriel. So Gabriel, so it's basically from God his message, Gabriel brings it down to Prophet Muhammad. So Prophet Muhammad, then he learns from Gabriel and then he recites to the people. That's how the revelation came in the period of 23 years. So that's it. So the people, the congregation like Prophet Muhammad, for example, he's uh, and as the companions, they cannot see Gabriel. It's only Prophet Muhammad. And then he would recite. What's really interesting is because the recitation is done in Arabic language, there's so many experts in Arabic language, they were observing this. They were looking for mistakes in grammar, they were looking for mistakes in factual mistakes, they were doing all this counter-checking and everything. And they themselves realized that, where is Muhammad getting all this from? Because he's not a poet. He doesn't know how to read, he doesn't know how to write, he's born amongst us, we know everything about him, and still he's speaking with such powerful verses that, where is it coming from? So Prophet Muhammad said that it is coming from God. And that's why everybody believed in him, because they done all the checks, and they just realized that they can't produce anything like that. So that's a revelation. The second question I've already answered is that revelation only comes to those that God has chosen to receive revelation. We believe about 124,000 prophets has received revelation in throughout the whole of history of humanity. And the names, as we all know, as Abraham, Moses, Jesus, David, Solomon, and finally the last messenger is Prophet Muhammad, and so many before. In the Quran we have some of these names. The Quran says that many of the stories of the prophets we mentioned in the Quran, but many of this, those prophet, prophet stories of Prophet Muhammad I've never mentioned it except by indication. But that's all it is about the revelation. Sorry, you had a question. Hey, just a question about fasting. And I have children start from a young start from sort of around eight, right? Oh, oh sorry. It's just a question about fasting and for children when they start when they're young. Is it must be quite tricky for them when they first start? Is it a way how do you make it easier for them? Because we found that tonight they don't drink water, it's, it must be spill on them. Yeah. How they so, it. so this is really good. Children actually are not required to fast unless they reach the age of maturity. So we're looking at 13, 14, depending on the maturity age. So that's when they have to fast. Other than, they get so excited and they want to fast. So what we do, we tell them very easily. We tell them that you fast, but if you feel dehydrated, you need water, anything like that, break it, because they're allowed like that. But yeah, you're right. Uh, you know, I have a, an 11 year old and he doesn't want to break his fast. And even he was ill and he asked me these questions. So although I've answered him, you know, I'm, I'm an imam here, but I'm a father at home. So he wasn't believing me. He said, you sure I can break it? I said, yes. I had to show him the Quran and everything like that. He read the verses and the foundation, and then he said, but if I were to fast, will it, be, will it be still okay? I said, yes, but you're ill, you have to take medicine. You know, so he said, okay. If he gets worse, then I'll take the medicine. And he, so they're, they're excited because 
They know the mom is making a nice iftar meal, and they want to wake up early in the morning. And because everybody, the environment in the house, everybody is fasting, they fast. But we tell everybody that if the children are fasting, let them fast, but tell them the choice. That the moment they feel weak, or they want to drink water, something like that, let them do it. So yeah, that's all it is. But if they, they are very strong, you know, I mean, those who go to school, we tell them that if they're a young age, have the in the school dinner, you know, school lunch and everything, because it's a very tough day. But in the holiday, in the weekend, if you want to try, you could try. That's, that's, that's the advice that we give them. Yes, anybody else have any other questions? The mic will come to you if you raise your hand. Yes, uh, one here. Please. I'd like to announce a... Yeah, go ahead. I'd like to announce a benefit event for Gaza, the medical aid for Palestine, on Sunday the 14th of April in the afternoon. So if you'd like your leaflet, you can come and get one from me. Thank you. Thank you very much. Another example of everybody's love for humanity, and, and, and that's, 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 that's what we have to look at this morning. Thank you very much, and to your whole, whole team. Thank you. Anybody else have any other questions? Okay. That's why I didn't want to preach. You know, I said, I'm just going to talk to you, and that's it. So you could ask anything else, any other questions about the mosque, because Aisha is waiting with her laptop here. She's got loads of... <laughs> I'm going to call Shafi. Shafi has got a lot to say as well, I'm sure. So uh, if you don't have any more questions, I'm going to hand over to Shafi. So Shafi, let me just tell you a little bit about him. Some people, they think he doesn't do anything. <laughs> and some people think that he does everything. The truth is in the middle. <laughs> okay? Uh, so the maintenance of the mosque is responsible of that. He wants to make sure the mosque looks really nice. So whenever he stands up in the mosque, not many people like him. The reason why he asks for money. He said, guys, I gotta make my, I gotta paint again, you know, I gotta, I've gotta put more beautiful lights and etc. So you know what? And then that's the you know, So everybody like, oh man, that they, they they tell me, text me privately, Imam, please get the prayer started. Because Shafi's gonna take so long, you know. <laughs> so Shafi is, and he's got a whole team. We have a lot of volunteers. I just want to let everybody know our volunteers. Uh, I guess very last mentioning, but the beautiful thing about Town Hall, we have a lot of volunteers. They take the free time out and they will clean the mosque. You know, they will hoover the mosque like that. They don't get paid. Even if you want to pay them, they don't want it because, because this is a mosque, they want to get reward from God Almighty, from Allah. So that's why they will hoover the mosque, they will clean the mosque, they will clean the windows. Some will come just to clean the bathroom and toilets. Honestly, they will come and some of them will, uh, will give the time. So when we are doing the night prayer, because it's late night and we have a lot of children coming here, women coming here, etc. People are, so they actually patrol the whole area, make sure that everybody's safe so nobody just you know, just comes in. It never happened, but just in case it's better to be safe than sorry. Uh, you know, so these are the risk assessments they take that everybody is safe, they will go home. So they patrol the whole area. These are our young boys and they take the free time out. A lot of young girls out there, they actually do a bake sale as well. They sell cake and etc. so that the money could be given to the orphans in Palestine. So they are raising money so that we can send money to those who are in need, those who are in medical help, etc. I think last year, how much we raised, Shifi? Last year we raised, just by sending biscuits and cakes, 5,000 pounds. All of them were given to charity. We're trying to raise much more this year as well so that we can be given to charity. So we try to do everything, every little thing we can. And those cakes, by the way, this is a very interesting story. Where are these cakes coming from? Our volunteers, they bake it and they give it and they sell it. So people, they buy it and everything else goes to charity as well. But this is how we do things here. So the mosque is really good. A lot of volunteers are here. You'll see them walking around. They like to do this. So today you'll see a lot of people serving you food. These are all our volunteers. You know. So there's only about three, four individuals who are actually you know, are officially working and getting paid. The rest are all volunteers. You know. So this is really interesting. Uh, and you'll see all of them uh, in front of you. So I would like to thank all the volunteers whenever we need them, they're ready. So you know, a round of applause for our volunteers. Well, now, maybe for donations. I'm going to ask Shafi to come in front. <laughs> so I am here. Sorry, I'm going to be here. If anybody has any questions, so I'll be coming around and you could ask, you know, maybe you could have more political discussion privately. Okay. Can I ask Councillor Keith Maynard to come up to the
it's quite for your attention to me, Pastor. <laughs> Shappy. I'm going to ask you to speak. So I'm actually going to get Shappy involved in this. And can you come over here as well? No, yeah, I'm, come, come over here. Yeah. <laughs> Look, all politicians, right? No, the reason I'm doing this is because the, the, the first time I ever met these gentlemen, we were knocking on doors. Yeah? It wasn't for an election, though, like we are at the moment, because um, there is an election at the moment for the GLA. And I'm not going to talk about that. It's about knocking on doors, um, because we met Hold the mic up. just over 12 and a half years ago. Yes. About 12 and a half years ago. 2010. 2010. And we started talking about plans for this mosque. Um, and then we started to talk about how we were going to present this to the local council, um, including I and a number of colleagues came up to the planning committee to talk about it. But in between all of that, we were out knocking on doors. But we weren't knocking on doors about politics. We were talking to the local community here about the idea of having the mosque here. And I was incredibly proud and pleased at the reception we got on the door on a regular basis over, I think we did it for about two and a half months, didn't we? We kind of got together on a regular set of sessions. And it has meant it's not just a building now, but it's a thriving community. The whole process is owned by the community, enjoyed by the community, and as we can see tonight, supported by the community mm -hmm. and that work I found incredibly satisfying when we did it at the time because it did bring back a little bit of the positive about humanity and the way it behaves and this building is literally a testimony to humanity and the positive things in life so it's not about me tonight it's not about politics it's about <coughs> unlocking the kind of success it can have. Well done. Thank you very much, Councillor, for those words. We really appreciate it from Canmore Masjid. And now I'd just like to ask our Chairman and Trustee Sage Shahi to come up on stage and thank you all um, for your attendance today and then we'll be off to break our fast. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh and good evening. Um, thank you. And thank you all to accept our invitation and once again you are here in community farm. Um, first and foremost from a sincere apologies from the mosque and the volunteers and the congregations. Yes, it's quite late. We do our prayers and it might be a disturbance outside the mosque. So we apologize for that, but it's only six, seven days left. If I write seven, eight days. Seven eight days, seven to eight days left. We'll be finishing off. So uh, please accept our apologies. If we full seven days, I've got, been told the full seven days. Of, so we have to fast another seven days. Uh, so once again, the apology from the mosque, from the volunteers, and from everyone. Um, secondly, I would like to say, as you know, Ash has mentioned a lot of activities we do, we do in the mosque. But one thing she forgot: we have a community garden. We have a community garden, and this garden is, at the moment, you can't even to see it because we have marquees are there where we do our iftar, our, our, some of our meals there. But after the Ramadan ends, we'll take the marquee off, and then you can see the beautiful garden. We have a water fountain there, we have beautiful plants are there. But one thing, unfortunately, including myself, we're not expert on the plants. We have a beautiful heart. That's why we have the garden, but we are not expert on plants. So in this opportunity, I would like to take and I'll ask anybody among yourself would like to volunteer to become a gardener for the mosque. 
and also that where we can train our youth, our young generation. So I can arrange a workshop through Aisha in the mosque, maybe once, twice a month. You can come and teach our, uh, our youth in the mosque to how to do the gardening and they can slowly, slowly, they can look after the garden uh, uh, through uh, your uh, help. So if anybody or one of you uh, would like to help us, please contact Aisha, myself or any of the volunteers. We'll take your numbers and we'll contact you after the Ramadan. Thirdly, as Sheikh mentioned, that I order the food according to what I like. Yes, I order what I like, but I think between him and me, he finished it off before me. You can see the difference between him and me. Mullah, come. That's the sad. I don't know the way scale, otherwise we could have been weighing ourselves. <laughs> so uh, we have a nice food for everyone. Uh, I, won't I won't tell you the menu for right now. I want that surprise. But one thing I'll tell you, if you are vegan or vegetarian, we have option for that as well. So please let our volunteer know, and then we'll be able to arrange it. The food will be arranged in the garden. If you're not comfortable to sit on the floor, just let us know. We'll be arranging the food over here with the chairs. But we'll ask our regular Muslim, uh, if you just go to the garden, inshallah, and eat uh, the ifar. For the sisters, we have arrangement upstairs. So any of the sisters in here, if you would, would like to see our sisters, you can go upstairs and uh, you can have iftar, or you can, uh, wherever you feel free, you can sit down here, you can have iftar with us as well. Um, that's all from Canton Masjid, and once again, I'd like to say thank you very much, everyone, to come into the mosque. Thank you. Next time, when you come, I'll ask for donation. <laughs> Okay, brothers and sisters, we have about 20 minutes left until we're breaking our fast. So, yeah. So if um, the so our Musali sisters, if you all want to head upstairs um, and start preparing, and for those of you who are here for our community iftar, you're free as well to head upstairs and meet uh, our community sisters. Um, Okay, we'll just give you some time to get to know each other. This is only once in a once in a year, as we know. So I'll leave it at that. Thank you very much for attending again, and we hope you enjoy the food. Thank you.